welcome home. This is the Irish Roots Cafe, where every day's a holiday, and there's always room for one more. Come right this way. Have a seat with me today in the corner booth. Hey, that corner booth is getting pretty well worn now. We may have to get some new upholstery for it. That's because we're celebrating our 120th week. Sweeney, clear that floor. Katie, bar the door. Molly, put on another pot of Irish coffee and maybe some Irish tea. And bring out the Irish dancers. It's time we get this show on the road. We've got another full house today, not a chair to spare. I'm Michael Laughlin, your host. You can reach me on my webpage at irishroots.com. And be sure to check out the written show notes on my blog. Uh, I've got a lot of little links there that you can go to and click as you're uh, 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 interested in something special. You might just be able to click on it instead of trying to memorize a, a blog or search for it on the web. And uh, remember that uh, you can phone 816-256-3360 to leave your comments on my recorder any old time. Uh, try that out. You'll like it if you need it. And uh, what do we have left here? Hey, it's time for today's topics. Among today's topics, one, the Irish family name of the week is Irwin. Two, 21 Irish embassies to be scrapped. Three, Irish Roots Audio, the life of Joseph Murphy. Number four, searching Moriarty, Brannigan, and Anderson. Number five, Dublin Irish Festival and Academy, the end of the month. Number six, great land rush to genealogy wise has begun. Number seven, 2009 World Flea coming up. All that and more. Hey, it's time for this week's topics. I mean, hey, we did this week's topics. Now it's time for the notes for the week. Well, here's the notes for the week. The Dublin Irish Festival begins... Uh, July 31st to August 2nd. Of course, you probably know that we've been doing that for the last 11 years, so you should know. And uh, that's a good one. We've been going there, and it seems like every year they add an acre or two, and uh, there's more entertainment and fun. Uh, now, we're also going to the Dublin, Ohio Acad Academy courses from July 29th to 30th. That's the two days before the festival. Be sure to see us there. Uh, we're going to be at the uh, genealogy tent for the whole time at the... Uh, festival over the weekend and we're going to be at the Dublin Academy classes for that uh, Sean Nose class it's a Sean Nose singing class and I was interested in the history of Sean Nose song and uh, got a real nice teacher there and I thought well heck this is a perfect time to find out I'm not that sure what Sean Nose singing is but I looked it up on Wikipedia and they said well uh, you're supposed to miss a note every now and then so it's not perfect and no two versions sound quite the same. And maybe you're not supposed to go over an octave and a half. And I thought, boy, this sounds like my kind of music. Uh, but I think it's any way if Sean Noser wants to sing it, he'll sing it. <laughs> That's for sure. It's in the old way, the old style. But the first song I ever heard described as that was uh, was this one here. It went something like, uh, Oro shade of Ahawalia. Oro shade of a hawalia, Oro shade of a hawalia, Honey share hockton tari. Now, for the rest of it, you're going to have to go over to the uh, Irish Song and Recitation podcast. I actually, I actually memorized five verses to that thing in in the Irish. Not that someone who knew Irish would recognize it. They might say that sounds like Italian. Uh, I don't know, but it sure was fun in the doing. Uh, hey, while we're talking about Irish festivals, they're they're all over the states. You know that you can you can just look up and see on the web. But uh, here's another one: uh, the Pittsburgh Irish Festival is September 11th to 13th. So you got uh, sure got time to plan for that one. And that's at the Riverplex at Sandcastle. Link on the blog. Well, let me see. Number two, I got a note the other day from Kathleen Hinckley. And she said to mention the ninth annual British Institute. Uh, they're offering Irish and English research, and the courses are taught by experts in their field of genealogy research in Salt Lake City itself. And the date is October 5th to 9th. And uh, 
It's uh, $415 for members and $435 for non-members. So if you got the cash, make the splash. Uh, you can see the web for more information. Uh, link is on the blog. And number three, of course, I've got to mention uh, that biggest overnight sensation I've seen in a long time uh, uh, on genealogy-wise on the web. If you happen to be searching for your family, uh, boy, I tell you, that's the place to go right now. You never know how they work out long term, but uh, it's gone from zero members to about 5,000 in just a few days, I think it is. Uh, so be sure to do it. I'll have a link to uh, my group page on the uh, blog. Or you can go to genealogywise.com and look for Irish Roots Cafe. You get to my fan page. And when you get on there, they give you a free page. Plus, you can start a free page up for uh, your spe special interest, like uh, your surname group. Uh, so really, it's sort of fun. And you know what? It's free. And just like just about any time in hard times or good times, if it's free, it's worth checking out, shall we say. Hey, the book of the month, what's it going to be today? Well, this is going to be audiobook excerpt number one. We're going to cover some excerpts from our first audiobook that we're putting together right now. We don't have the final cuts done, but uh, we thought you'd give you a flavor of some things that have a wider coverage than just, uh, say, just Missouri, even though it's the Missouri Irish book. We cover Joseph Murphy and the Murphy Wagon uh, in some depth, and his story is really uh, an important one for America. It began in Ireland as a young boy, and uh, he came to America and had a major impact on all those who settled in the American West. Uh, it's going to be read by Molly Nickel, who's putting that together. That's Molly of the Irish Coffee fame here on the uh, podcast. And uh, we touch a little bit on the life of Joseph Murphy, just the first three or four minutes. And like I said, he was born to Ireland, and he was shipped off to St. Louis as a boy to meet with his uh uncles, the Hullen brothers. That would be her, his mother's family, I believe. And you know what? The problem was when he made that trip down the Ohio River after crossing the Atlantic Ocean, uh, and he went to find the Hullen brothers, they had disappeared never to be found again. And uh, needless to say, they weren't on the farm where he was supposed to meet them at, and somebody else held the farm uh, uh, mortgage. And wouldn't you know, that was another Irishman uh, by the name of Melanfi who was re reputed to be the richest I Irishman uh, west of the Mississippi in those parts. They ended up becoming acquainted later, but uh, I don't think they had quite a meeting yet. Uh, now, the Holland boys, like I said, they had disappeared, and somebody said they had gone to uh, New Orleans, but nobody ever heard from them again. So poor old young Joe Murphy, he uh, he was a prince apprentice to the wagon make maker, Matthew Doherty. And boy, you know what? You go back another a couple decades and you're going to find the words J. Murphy are adorning thousands of wagons on the California and Oregon trails. And he made a special wagon just for the Santa Fe Trail. You know, you see those folks, they passed a tax per wagon uh, for, for supplies going down that way. So he thought he'd outsmart them and he just made one wagon that was as big as three or four, I think it was. And uh, that way you beat the tax man. Boy, we should, we sure could use some new Murphy wagons today, and I think it's going to be more important tomorrow. There's no doubt about it. But some 200,000 of his wagons are said to have been used by uh, America in settling the West. So he's a good one, and most people don't know about, but he was sure a uh, newsmaker in his day. The Life of Joseph Murphy one year after the lands of Missouri came under American control in 1804, Joseph Murphy was born in Ireland. Baptized as Malachi, he was the son of James and Mary Hullen Murphy. His family lived at Thornogs near Drogheda in County Louth. Joseph's twin brother, Patrick, remained in Ireland. Another fate awaited Joseph, who was raised a few miles away by his grandfather. At the age of 12, he sailed from Dublin Bay to Liverpool and then to St. John's, Newfoundland. He then boarded the Duchess of Richmond, traveling to Philadelphia. His 19-year-old aunt accompanied him on the nine-month journey to St. Louis. 
The farm of the three Holland brothers in St. Louis was their intended destination. The Holland brothers, however, were more inclined to theater and Shakespearean drama than they were to life upon the farm. Joseph and his Aunt Bridget were looking forward to a warm and comfortable welcome from them upon arrival. St. Louis was growing and Irishmen were prominent citizens of the day. Charles had begun his newspaper over a decade ago, and another paper had been started by rival Irishmen as well. Brady and McKnight had arrived and set up shop with the rest of the Irish crowd when the town was still strongly French. John Melanthe, the first millionaire west of the Mississippi, and his son Brian were well-known and influential. The first sheriff, Jeremiah Connor, was actively engaged in assisting new Irish immigrants and formed the Aaron Benevolent Society in the year of Murphy's arrival. The Irish were the largest foreign-born element in the predominantly Roman Catholic city at that time. Only 12 years old, Joseph Murphy didn't know too much about St. Louis life. As they traveled overland to Pittsburgh and down the Ohio to Shawneetown, Illinois, he was probably filled with anticipation. In September, they arrived by wagon on the eastern bank of the Mississippi, anxious to make the crossing. They took a rowboat to the western bank and arrived in St. Louis, docking at Market Street. They were finally home. All they needed was to find the Holland farm and settle in. They were to be disappointed. The Holland brothers were gone, never to be heard from again. After unsuccessfully engaging in the whiskey business, it was rumored that they left for New Orleans. The farm was now controlled by mortgage holder Brian Melanthe, a man who would have continued contact with Murphy. Homeless and tired, Joseph worked as a farmhand in Florissant, near his original destination. The Melanthes had tried to establish a colony of Celts near Florissant, but it was apparently unsuccessful. His Aunt Bridget stayed in the city, which was rapidly becoming a trade center. Thousands of settlers would move west through St. Louis. This fact would shape young Joseph's future. Joseph's Aunt Bridget became acquainted with Matthew Doherty, who had a shop in town along with his father. Matthew Doherty soon convinced the young Joseph Murphy that his future lie in the town, and Murphy became an apprentice wagon maker in 1819. Well, that does it for that. Let's see. Uh, you know, coming up, we're going to talk about the 2009 World Flea and uh, let you know which county it's in and just exactly when it's taken place. But now you know what time it is? It's time to raise our eyes skywards, give thanks, and ask for help. Here are today's Magnificent Seven. <laughs> Number one, Diane Den of Portland, Oregon. Your county Mayo genealogy and family history notes have shipped. Uh, number two, Denise E. Ford of Mount Compass, Australia. Your county Down genealogy and family history notes has shipped. Number three, welcome to new member Joan Albright of Desborough, Canada. Your Armagh genealogy has shipped. And, uh, Jones looking for information on Grandfather Daniel D. Moriarty, born approximately 1872, and it might have been in Killarney. Uh, the parents were Daniel Mon Moriarty, and the mother was, uh, uh, maybe it was Carmel or Cameo K. Larned. Uh, so you might help her there. If you got anything you know, you just uh, pass it on to me, and I'll get it to her, or I'll get you in contact somehow. Number four, new member Aaron Brannigan of New Milford, New Jersey. Welcome. Uh, and they're searching for Brannigan, who came to Jersey City, New Jersey, in May of 1848. Number five, Annie J. Brooks of Dorset in the U.K. Your Fall of Irish Chiefs and Clans, which is volume one of the Conquest of Ireland, that shipped, and you know it may already be there by now. The post office says it's supposed to be there, but uh, you don't want to bet money on that all the time because nobody's perfect, not even the post office. 
Number six, new member Diane Ricker of Falmouth, uh, Maine, searching for the lineage of James Anderson, reportedly from Money Moore, County Londonderry. And he was one of those who immigrated to the U.S. in 1718 in a five-ship Ulster migration. That was a group trip, and there's probably records of that on the other side of the water. And he supposedly was one of the original settlers of Londonderry, New Hampshire in the USA. And they say they they were my sixth great-grandfather. Seven, Deborah Deborah Thompson of Research Victoria, Australia, your Annals of Ireland by the Four Masters has shipped. And that's going to do it today for the top seven members. Uh, Hey, thanks to all our members, because without you, None of this would be possible. I say it every week, but it's true. Uh, it keeps the whole thing going, so uh, I sure do appreciate it. And uh, if I could see you each and every one in person, I'd tell you, but there's no way for me to do that. I only get out once a year, and that's up to uh, Dublin, Ohio. Hey, now we're going to move on to the Irish family name of the day. Well, the name of the day today is Irwin. And uh, that's in honor of one of our new members. And the related spelling of the name is, it can be Irwin or Irvin or Irvine or Irving. You can add an E to the end of that name, originally spelled E-R-W-I-N by our member. You can add a G to the end. You can add an E to the end. Uh, uh, And that first letter can be an E or an I. So Irwin, it's the sound of the name that counts, even though originally it stood for different families. Hey, and this is part of Variant Spelling Groups number 950 and 951, uh, taken from the Master Guide to the Various Spellings of Irish Family Names. Well, we take a quick little look at some uh, notes on the name. Now, the name Irvine and Irvine are often found uh, equated with the names Irwin and Irwin, but they're actually two distinct families. That's in the beginning. Uh, the, the ones spelled with the E on the end were different from the ones that didn't have the E on the end originally. And hey, take a look at the place names in Ireland. You can find uh, Irving's Town in County Fermanagh. And that marks uh, f- one family of the name who had a lot of holdings there and in adjoining Donegal. And some give the name of Irvine as coming from a Scottish place name originally. And o- others give Irwin, uh, starting with an I, as of English origins. The Irwin family of Rathmoyle County, Roscommon, come from John Irwin of Ballandary, who was born in 1618, and the Irwin family of Derry Gore County, Fermanagh, descend from George Irwin, who died in Derry Gore in 1791. And the Irwin family of Mount Irwin County, Armagh, is given in the Irish uh, Book of Arms, as are the other two uh, families cited there, and uh, We're moving up to that in just a moment. Now, I took a look in the Irish Book of Arms, and what we found, we found all three of those families just mentioned, and their arms are illustrated in a rough black and white form. And, uh, you know, some of them have uh, a trefoil, a little three-leaf plant there in the middle. Uh, One of them had a crown put there, I think, instead of a, a trefoil. I can't remember now. You know how memory is, but uh, they're sure there. They're sure, sure illustrated, and all three of them are related, so you think they might have stemmed from the same person originally or from the same family uh, because their arms are almost identical. And, uh, hey, you know what? Coming up later in this episode, we're going to find out what it costs for a phone line in County Kerry. Now, I want all you out there to make a guess and say it out loud so you all can vote on it and see who comes closest when I read the answer here at the end of the uh, uh, show. Um, But that leads us to just one more thing here. The Free Master Index Search of Irish Names found the family several times, and we found it uh, in an article among the early Irish in Albany, and that's in the Journal of the American Irish Historical Society, Volume 23. Uh, We found it in the book uh, Malaysian Families of Ireland, and that gives a lot of old families and the supposed date they arrived in Ireland. And the old uh, Irish names and surnames by the Reverend Patrick Wolfe, it's in there. 
And uh, it won't surprise you to find that the name's in the families of County Donegal, Ireland. And, of course, the uh, Surnames of Ireland book uh, that was by Ed Nefsey uh, with 200 maps, Surname loco- Location Maps, it's in that book. And then there's a uh, C. Irwing, and he spelled the end. Boy, that's E-R-W-I-N-G-E. Sounds more like Irwing. Uh, but uh, that's in the Special Census of Ireland Pinner's Survey. That's how that particular survey uh, taker spelled the name. And we also find it in the Names of Irish Passengers to America. That's in there four times. Uh, so there's no problem finding uh, Irwins, and those are all the, all the names that begin with an E. And now it's just about time to do what? We're going to take a look at some websites of the week. Uh, I'm going to list a couple of them on my uh, blog with direct links. Uh, one of them is Irwin Genealogy Queries, and the other one is uh, Irvin, Irving, Irwin, and Irwin, and related surnames. So that might help you out some more there if you're just starting your search and don't really know which way to turn. Number two, I'm going to make that Irish Roots community on Genealogy Wise uh, another web page you should check out. Number three, uh, the International Genealogy Festival at the University of Strathclyde, and that's from uh, Tuesday the 21st to Friday the 24th of July in Glasgow, Scotland, 2009. And uh, uh, I found that at strathclydegenealogy.co.uk. And uh, they say it's a supported event in Scotland's National Homecoming Celebrations. I think they're trying to make this a big day, and... Uh, a lot of overlap with the Irish and Scottish, Scottish bloodlines and families, so if you're in that area, be sure to check it out. And number four, my favorite Sean Nose uh, song video. That's uh, that song I started a little bit earlier, and uh, some old fella back 20 or 30 years ago was singing it, and they recorded it, and uh, just had a real good tenor to it, so I'm putting it on there in case you're just curious. Hey, speaking of curious, that's what's coming up next. Curious news and notes. Well, number one, Tim O'Connor from the Gap of Dunlow in County Kerry got some sad news. He wrote in and asked him how much it had cost him to, to bring a phone line into his house. And they told him it had cost 29,000 euros to do that. And you see, it would take 43 poles and 2,400 meters of cable. So it's a mobile phone for all those folks out there. And I'm sure a lot of you have been down to that gap of Dunlow, and you know how remote some of those houses are. But my, my, what a cost. It's a good thing they invented that cell phone. Number two, uh, free-range cows in the burn in County Clare. I just read this little note. It said that the government ministers are going to allow... Uh, uh, the program of those cows uh, uh, grazing free on some of the national landmarks there, like around the Polnabrone do- Dolmen in County Clare. And they say it not only is, is just nice and uh, the tourists like it, but they say that it improves the water quality and diversity. Now, how is diversity improved by a cow being put out to pasture? Maybe that, since there's a life form and it's not just a pasture and rock, it's more of a diverse landscape, but that's the first time I've heard that word used. And just leave leave it to an Irish politician, perhaps, to give new uses to a word. But that was in the Irish Times. I thought it was interesting. But you know what? I'm gonna, you know, uh, there's also I've got another article, and it, perhaps that's a sign of, uh, of, of something becoming too popular, because uh, I've got a story in Killarney that sort of. I don't think they like diversity too much down there because, well, I guess they're having a lot more tourists in the last, you know, five or ten years, and a lot of tourists bring a lot more, a lot more jaunting cart operators and a lot more jaunting cart horses, and well, you know what that brings, and as as a result of too much horse dung being left on the site, uh, those famous jaunting carts have been banned from Killarney after refusing after few, to do what. They have refused to diaper their horses. Ah, uh, what's the world coming to? 
At least that's the way it was when I first read it. It may have been settled by now. I don't know, but I can't imagine Killarney without jaunting carts. That's for sure. Uh, talk about diversity. Well, let's move on here to the, uh, let me see, the uh, World Flea that's coming to County Mayo. And that's the Ireland's Traditional Folk and Celtic Music Festival. And I tell you, it was first held in County Kerry in 2006. And it's going to be at Castlebar, County Mayo, July 31st uh, through August 8th. And boy, they've got the Dannon and Mary Black and uh, Martin O'Connor, uh, the Kilfenora Cayley Band, the High Kings. Oh, lots of folks crazy about the High Kings. Uh, the Women of Ireland. Uh, Dave Manelli, oh, who else we got here? Uh, Georgette Jones, Matt Cunningham, uh, Cherish the Ladies. They're big in the States. I know a lot of these festivals I go to, you see the Cherish the Ladies. Uh, By Brian Baru, Kaylee Band, uh, Randy Travis. Well, what do you know? We got Randy Travis showing up there. Uh, that's all right. So that's what the flea is. And Hey, if you don't know how to spell flea, it's F-L-E-A-D-H, just in case you're reading along and you think, you think you've come to the wrong page, that might help you out. Uh, what else we have left here? Uh, that's the flea. We've got that. And, uh, well, how about the, uh, there's an Irish government board or advisory board, and they've made some suggestions on how the uh, government and the people will survive uh, hard economics times. And I was reading an article, and they say they're thinking about charging by the glass for water uh, just so no one gets away with anything. And teachers should not get 30 days unmonitored sick leave. Uh, that sick leave should be monitored all right. You don't know what those teachers should be getting away with. And, uh, hey, they want to scrap the least, the 21 least important embassies and sell off the buildings and take that money to... Uh, uh, pay off some bills, I guess. And here's a good one. If you're over 65, they want you to now pay for a passport. Uh, no telling how how you're going to misuse that passport traveling all over the world when you're 65. Uh, I don't know. They might want to think again on that. And they also want to stop the $1 million euro project to clean up the graffiti. Well, now, you know, that's all right. Graffiti's not a help to anyone. And, uh, they want to make those convicted of minor crimes do the cleanup. So if you were in Ireland and you hit the speed limit a little bit too much or you uh, stayed out or you jaywalked or something at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, you might have to spend a week over there scrubbing the walls and have to come home and say, uh, well, I'll be a week late now. Uh, would that be all right with you or not? I don't know. I guess if it would save the country, it would be okay. There is worse things that could happen. Oh, boy, but that takes it all down to the last one, and that is the tourist rate to Ireland's been dropping, and it dropped 18% in May. Now, U.S. remains even from last year, but uh, Britain shows the biggest drop, a drop of 23%, and that's a bundle. And can anybody say lower prices are here? I think that's what it means, and I've seen some nice specials advertised. You have to act uh, fairly quick, but... Uh, there's some good prices out there. If you were wanting to go to Ireland, this might just be the time. Well, that does it for today, folks. We're right on time. Remember to send your comments by clicking the contact link on our webpage at www.irishroots.com or send by mail to our American address, the Irish Roots Cafe, Box 7575, Kansas City, Missouri, 64116. Leave your message or report on things in your part of the world when you call my phone recorder at 816-256-3360. And find me on MySpace at Irish Roots Cafe, on Facebook at Mike O'Laughlin, and on Twitter at Irish Roots Cafe. Oh, yeah, now genealogy-wise, get me on there, too. And remember, members foot the bill so they get first priority, but we're open to all... And by the way, a big thank you to all of our members. And away. Uh,